صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء فنعم أجر وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاء سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء حيث نشاء
You guys should definitely check out um, his book, Opposing the Imam, which he'll be speaking about today, as well as his new text. Maybe you can speak about it during the Q&A. I've not gotten my copy yet, so I can't speak to it uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of detail. Um, that being said, That being said, Dr. Nabil Hussain is Associate Professor at University of Miami, Florida, holds his PhD from uh, Princeton University, um, and has a lot of research, uh, research, a lot of research is tied to our Islamic historiography and he studies, um, and I am absolutely certain that you're all going to benefit, and if no one benefits, I felt like we called him, so that I can hang out with him, and so that I can benefit myself. So, without further Islamic history in the writing of early Islamic history or Islamic historiography, um, as uh, Sheikh Jaffer mentioned. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, uh, Sheikh Fahad Jaffer, Saad Noor, the Islamic uh, Center of NYU, and the Sacred Door Project for giving me this opportunity uh, to share a little bit about uh, what I've been thinking about for the past almost 10 years. So how did we get here? 
Ali ibn uh, Ibn Abi Talib, uh, the fourth caliph in Islamic history, the man at the center of the portrait before you, was the close kinsman of the Prophet, who married uh, the Prophet's daughter Fatima, and thus became the father of all of the Prophet's grandchildren. He's revered for his wisdom, his swordsmanship, and piety, and he almost needs no introduction. Uh, he's revered as a saint in Sunni Islam, and within Shia Islam, he is the second holiest figure after the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he's assassinated in 660 of the Common Era, uh, after four turbulent years as Caliph. What I argue is the ghettoizing of Ali in Muslim culture and in academia is quite common. And what I mean by this is that his political career is only ever discussed in the context of Shiism. Uh, the same can be said about his famous son Hassan, depicted on your left, and his son Hussein, depicted on your right. The latter being famously killed in the large-scale massacre uh, that is commemorated each year in Shi'i culture. There's this unspoken rule that these heroes of Shi'i Islam and the life that they led after the Prophet's death. And I'm talking about when the Prophet's alive and Hassan and Hussein are little kids jumping on his back. What I mean is that after his death, they made decisions about uh, politics and about ethics that are only discussed in Shi'i settings or in Sunni settings that aim to implicitly or explicitly discredit Shi'i doctrines about these figures. And so why write this book? This book aims to provide a context and space to understand the tensions, the stories, the evolution of understanding about the political lives uh, of these figures in non-Shi settings. Thus, I directed my attention primarily to Sunnism. I studied Sunni hadith, uh, those considered canonical and others that are not. I turned to the literature of another sect, uh, common in North, or found in North Africa and Oman, known as the Ibabi. Uh, and an early influential and rationalist theological school known as the Muqtazila. To understand the diverse ways in which stories about Ali and his son Hussein have been told by Muslims outside of the context of Shiism. The impetus to write this book came from the discovery that this venerated Sunni caliph and Shi'i Imam, and here I'm speaking of Ali, was once publicly reviled in Muslim societies. I hope to understand the processes that facilitated Uh, the rehabilitation of his character in, or his reputation in Sunni Islam. I also aim to understand the grievances, the claims, the arguments of Ali's antagonists. I wanted to understand how is it that um, this group, which currently you could say um, is understood because, uh, because of the obscurity of their claims or the fact that it has gone extinct or the extinction of such sects that uphold this uh, view about Ali. Um, and so I engaged in this detailed study of the claims and arguments of Muslims who oppose uh, Ali's caliphate. And I did this because I wanted to understand the ways in which uh, these early antagonists um, continue to have an impact, continue to have a legacy in Islamic history uh, or in Islamic theological writing and Islamic literature So what are uh, key uh, terms that I'd like us to consider? Well, well, there's a cover of the book there, and then there's a cover of the book um, on the table, and this is a brief summary of what I just mentioned. But if we skip forward to uh, key terms that I'd like us to consider tonight, uh, there are many schools within the religion of Islam, each one consisting of revered scholars who define what is orthodoxy, right, or correct belief in the sight of God. And this evening, I want us to consider the ways in which Sunnism, the largest doctrinal school in the Muslim world, grappled with stories of Ali, and these diverse perspectives of Ali. Second, when I speak of canonical hadith collections, I'm talking about uh, those sayings of the Prophet that were compiled uh, in the Sunni tradition that came to be sources for orthodoxy and then orthopraxy. Orthopraxy being uh, ritual and law. The most revered collection is the one that is referred to in Arabic as a Muslim as Sahih, or the authentic collection of a scholar named Bukhari, who lived about 200 to 250 years after the Prophet. Uh, I don't want to get into the details, but the canonical culture around this book is one where faithful Sunnis believe that it is reliable from cover to cover. Um, and of course, you can have other revered collections, but they don't have that same um, canonical culture uh, uh, regarding their authenticity or their, uh, their authority. At the, other, at the other end of the spectrum, 
are biographical and historical texts. If you were a Sunni who wished to define orthodoxy and you found a text that disagreed with your sensibilities and it came from one of these historical uh, uh, or non-canonical sources, the choice is easy. You simply dismiss the credibility of that source. But that's much harder to do when it's coming from a text like Bukhari uh, or the authentic collection. And so near the end of my book, I look at the ways in which uh, scholars grappled with the tensions that arise when a collection like Bukhari's text um, preserves something that uh, later representatives of orthodoxy considered to be heretical or goes against their sensibilities of what they believed about Ali. How do you deal with that? You can't simply discard that text. And so lastly, I also wanted to state some territory for reverence for Ali in Sunni culture or you can say reverence for Ali in non-Shi circles. Uh, this explains the phenomenon of uh, reverence for the uh, Prophet's family, for those Sunni theologians who painstakingly argued against members of their schools or their contemporaries that Ali was a, senate, a saint or a spiritual heir or a judicious caliph at a time in which many of their uh, contemporaries uh, doubted or scoffed at these claims as simply Shi. So you have Sunnis and Muqtadis arguing these points. Uh, I'd argue that the earliest partisans of Ali may have had the identifier of Shi, meaning being a partisan of Ali, but, it, but reverence for him expanded beyond this group to include Muslims who revered him while having political and theological allegiances to other Muslims. Thus, reverence for Ali, or pro-Ali sentiment over the centuries following his death became a trans-sectarian phenomenon meaning that it was not just part of Shiism, but it gradually became part of Sunnism as well. Only a minority of schools followed a dedicated a school dedicated to Ali and his family, or Shiism, and the majority of Muslims until today, as, you, as many of you likely know, uh, understood religious and political authority as falling on the Prophet's disciples rather than just his family, and this becomes a cornerstone of Sunnism. And so it's with that brief introduction on the contours of Ali sentiment, uh, and to understand the stature of Ali through Muslim literature about him, I'd like us to turn to uh, the ways in which Muslims have understood Ali. So at the very end of chapter 33, verse 33 of the Quran, the verse reads, Indeed, God desires to keep all impurities from you, O members of the house, and purify you of thorough purification. It's known as the verse of purity, and it's related in canonical sources that the Prophet took his daughter Fatima, Ali, and their two sons, and prayed that God purify them when this verse was revealed. Muslims understood the Prophet's prayer to have been accepted and to have been answered. The community also agrees that Ali is the only caliph who was raised by the Prophet from infancy. On this subject, Ali is reported to have said in the Nahd al certainly you know my special status in the eyes of God's messenger and the close kinship I share with him. When I was only a child, he took charge of me and he brought me into his home. When I was a baby, he would hold me to his chest and cradle me arms. When I slept, I did so in his bed and beside him so close that I could smell his fragrance. To feed me, he would first chew the food and then offer it to me. As a child, never did he find me speaking a lie, nor any foolishness in my actions. So here we see Ali discussing how he was the only person among the Prophet's disciples to be raised in his home. He states that even as a child, he was obedient to the Prophet and followed the path of virtue. For Shi'is, these statements reflect the infallibility of Ali a doctrine upheld as orthodoxy in Shiism. But Ali continues, God sent a mighty angel to the Prophet in order to guide him both day and night along the path of fine morals and the perfection of character. During this time, I followed him like a young camel who follows the footprints of its mother. Every day he would stand as a banner and symbol of righteousness and morality and command me to follow him. Every year he would retreat and seclude himself in the mountains and the caves of Hira. There I would see him where no one else would see him, in those days, Islam did not exist in any house except in the house of God's prophet. He lived in this house with his wife Khadija, and after these two, I was the third, meaning he was the third Muslim. I saw the light of divine revelation and breathed in this sense of prophethood. Now, the question of authenticity aside, there's a sense here that the intent of this whole monologue is to convince the listener that Ali is the best person to follow and trust after the prophet. Ali is telling his audience that he had a uniquely intimate relationship with the Prophet. The 
implicit argument is that others can't claim to be superior to him in their knowledge of the Prophet or in being closer to him. It's true that the Prophet approved of Ali in ways that were unique. One indication of this is that the Prophet declined all other marriage proposals from prominent Muslims uh, who wanted to marry his daughter Fatima. Both he and Fatima held that Ali would be a suitable spouse for her. Shi'is believed that Fatima had a piety or a spiritual stature that was peerless among women, and so her spouse was also to resemble her in peerlessness. It can be said with confidence that the Prophet viewed Ali as his apprentice and trusted companion. It's for this reason that the Prophet says of Ali, he is of my essence and I am of his, or Ali and myself are raised from the same light. You are my brother in this world and hereafter. You are unto me as Aaron was unto Moses, and so on. And so far we've considered characteristics of Ali that are affirmed in canonical sources. When we turn to non-canonical hadith, statements that medieval Sunni scholars did not affirm were authentic, you could say we get into murkier waters, where the claims become more provocative. Historians note that the Prophet said of Ali, you are my heir, vizier, and successor after me. This sounds pretty straightforward regarding whom the Prophet favored as his successor. But there's a part of the statement that copyists of manuscripts could not agree on. In some places, the Prophet says, fi ahli, and in other statements, or in other sources, the statement is fi ummati. The ramifications of either statement are predictably enormous, otherwise I wouldn't be bringing it up. So according to one manuscript, the Prophet is simply noting that Ali will be the next chief of his family, namely the Hashemite tribe to which they both belong. In another, the statement is much wider in scope. The Prophet is appointing him as his successor in the entire community. And since we have both versions in Sunni collections, we're left asking, is this a Shi'i-affirming text, a smoking gun, if you will, that is defanged of its bite, which is changed in a different way? Or is this a simple, innocuous hadith, a simple statement from the Prophet that was enhanced with a Shi'i accretion? The authors that I study in this book, Opposing the Imam, in chapters 3 and 5, and Jahid and Ibn Taymiyyah, are adamant in supporting the second theory. So in this case, they're sure the Prophet said, Ali is my successor, fi ahli, right, amongst my kin, in the family of Beni Hashem. He's the next chief of the Hashem. But later, she's amended the text, so it reads fi ummati, so that Ali was a successor in the community. If you, re if you read Arabic, they'll mention that the lasam, or like the skeletal, the skeletal text, without the dots, looks very similar if you're reading the script, right? Fi ahli and fi ummati look quite similar. And over generations, manuscripts could could have that resemblance quite easily. Right? It's not as if someone is intentionally uh, changing it, but rather people are reading it and interpreting it in, uh, in a way that agrees with their sensibilities, of course. But um, it can go both ways. Right? So it's with this assumption that Jahid and Ibn Taymiyyah start blunting I call the, polem the polemical edge of any pro-Ali hadith that they see, where it suggests that he should be caliph. They argue that Shi's made up these reports, or they embellished them, or they read them out of their original context, right? So, like when the Prophet says, you are my heir here. Uh, are there any questions so far? I know we'll have a Q&A, but I just, this is kind of like one of those where you like drop something here, you know, in terms of Arabic manuscripts. All right, so who was the first one to speak? Well, so these are not, okay, so I'll give you an example. Suyuti cites both, <coughs> seems to have both versions in different places of his jannah, right, in his collection of hadith. And to me, it's unclear if over the generations a copyist mistook one of the versions and added it, or put it that way, or if Suyuti himself found both versions, but you can find both versions in, um, when I say non-canonical, so it's not going to be in the six collections of uh, Sunnah, but like in other 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 texts, other Quran. <coughs> yes. Are there like is there a sense of like how many times it's shown like that first way versus second like way and then grade two? Again, that's a great question, but I can't go back in time and see when was it that copyists were finding it the first way or the other. What happens? 
here's a problem that I'll find. In a 20th century version of a Fadal work, I don't know if an editor has made it fi ahli instead of fi ummati, and if the, the manuscript version he was using in, let's say, Turkey or in Iraq or in Syria had it one way or the other, you actually have to do the hard work of looking at the manuscripts and seeing what version they had. Um, and then we can sometimes use the, uh, um, we could say the, uh, the citations of medieval scholars, where they say, we know this work was, or this hadith was cited by Ahmed ibn Hanbal, but today we can't find where it is, but then what we've been able to find in the 20th and 21st century, there are lots of manuscripts um, that have been unpublished, or versions of some of his famous works that are unpublished. And so you might find it in Iraq, or you might find it in Iran, but or in, even in Yemen, but these are private manuscripts that people don't have access to. Right now. So, it's been, it's been a journey. All right, so, after the Prophet's death, the question of who would succeed him fragmented his uh, his companions or his disciples into a number of factions. The allegiances grew in their complexities as the decades passed. Here I'll try to start with simplicity and then gradually add to this knowledge base to help us frame the disagreements. First, there are those who supported authority going to the most senior members of the community who had the most clout. This faction became partisans of the first three caliphs, or the Uthmaniyya. Not only did they revere the memory of these three and view them and, and view them as pious authorities, but they also based <coughs> Islamic law and knowledge of religion on the followers of the first three, so Abu Bakr, Omar, and Islam. The second faction consisted of those who believed Ali was the natural heir to the Prophet. The clan to which both the Prophet and Ali belonged to were known uh, as the Hashemites, and so Hashemite kinsmen themselves, or Hashemite uh, members of the Hashemite tribe and their partisans, or people who revered them, held Ali to be the most knowledgeable and distinguished of the Prophet's disciples. And they revered him after the Prophet's death in ways that other Muslims did not. The third faction uh, to consider is represented by the clan of Ali's predecessor, the Umayyads. Ali's predecessor, Uthman, was assassinated after a siege of his home that lasted many weeks, if not months. And the family of Uthman blamed Ali for these events since those who had laid siege to the Caliph's home had respected Ali. Although Ali may not have been involved in the assassination, the Umayyads considered anyone who criticized Uthman culpable in this hyper-partisan atmosphere that believed if you're not with us, you're against us. And so this fomented tribal feud. Thus when Ali became the fourth Caliph, the Umayyads rebelled against him. And to Ali's dismay, the partisans of the first three Caliphs also rebelled against him, and thus his caliphate was rocked with civil war after civil war. To take a bird's eye view of how it all panned out, after Ali's assassination, the Umayyads take the reins of the caliphate and turn it into a dynastic monarchy. They rule for close to a century. Then there is a wide scale, a wide scale revolt that foments from Central Asia and heads west to topple them in Arabia. The leaders of this revolt pledge allegiance to the old rival of the Umayyads, and that is the, the Hashemites, right? the, the, the tribe of Ali. The Hashemites then have their own monarchy for five centuries until another army, the Mongols, lay siege to the empire and end their rule. So, if we wanted to take snapshots of allegiances to different religious and political authorities 100 years after the Prophet, it would look something like this slide. You'd have four factions with one of them split in two. You'd have those who revere the first three caliphs, those who revere the Umayyad dynasty, those who follow a Khadiji school or an independent school discussed in the book, but which we won't tonight. And lastly, you'd have this pro-Ali faction split uh, between those who say all authority should remain exclusive to Ali's family and those who revered Ali and his descendants but were more broad in viewing other members of the community as authorities as well. For example, there may have been some who viewed the first two caliphs as wise and pious leaders, but also respected Ali. And so they didn't, re they didn't view reverence for Ali and the first two caliphs as contradictory. Now, if we take a snapshot 200 years after the Prophet's death, these different circles would still be intact with the caveat that there is now a religious elite 
or ulama, scholars of the law and theology, who have become fed up with caliphs claiming to be successors to the prophet. And so they drive a new ethic in which they say that the scholars, the ulama, are the real warathat al-anbiya, the real heirs of the prophets. So while you have scholars that identify with the above factions as well, there's a set of, you could call them centrists, or nonpartisan centrists, who keep this ethic of we cannot judge what happened in the past. We're uncertain, we're unsure. We don't have enough knowledge, or we don't have enough information on who was right and who was wrong during all of these co conflicts uh, that occurred after the Prophet's death. And so we'll leave it to God to decide on who to punish and who to reward in the hereafter. And there were some who developed a new radical optimism that said, we, well, we might have our own theories on who's right and who's wrong, but we'll, ma we'll maintain a belief that God will forgive everyone who was involved. Now, if you wanted to locate Sunnism, it's part of this burgeoning community of centrist scholars who acknowledge that their own teachers and authorities may have been Umayyad or pro-Umayyad, may have been pro-three caliph, may have been pro-Hashimid, but they themselves as centrists are not. And so thus, when we read a Sunni hadith collection, it's important to realize that this will be a contribution reflecting all of these different factions, right? It'll have people who are pro three caliph, pro mid, or centrist. By contrast, when you read a Shi'i hadith work, uh, they're mostly written by partisans of the family of Ali, who view them as rightful men, or leaders of the community, both in terms of political power one last uh, snapshot is taken 300 years after the Prophet's death. I don't want to diminish the existence of other factions and schools outside of Sunnism and Shiism in terms of an enduring culture that existed surrounding Ali, but I think they can be put along this spectrum uh, and fall under one of these six different the first group is made up of zealous pro-3 caliph or pro-Umayyad or Kharaji Muslims who publicly condemn Ali and his family as evil. The second group doesn't condemn Ali outright, but opposes any special generation of him. They tend to say he was a fallible person who made mistakes, uh, he may have harmed the Muslim community when he became a caliph, and some in fact denied that he ever became a legitimate caliph. They would say that the legitimate caliphs were Abu Bakr or Omar Uthman, and then there was just fitna, or civil disobedience. Or there were even, in fact, some in North Africa that said Abu Bakr or Omar Uthman, and then the fourth rightly guided caliph is Muawiyah. So the third group then became uh, associated with what is the orthodox position of Sunnism, where Ali is accepted as the fourth rightly guided caliph. Uh, the fourth group uh, regarded him as the greatest Muslim after the Prophet, but not necessarily divinely appointed. The fifth group became associated with the orthodox position of Fulber Shiism, that Ali was the rightful heir of the Prophet, selected by God and Muhammad before his death. And the sixth group was made up of radical Shi'is, or Ghulat. And these were individuals who viewed Ali as the manifestation of God. Now, if the spectrum could be laid out from one through six, for those who held animosity for Ali all the way down to those who believed in his divinity, it would look something like this slide. All of this might seem a bit rudimentary, but I promise you the reason why I'm discussing this is that no one else has mapped out these nuances along this spectrum uh, before. The go-to model is anachronistic. It tends to imagine Sunnism and Shiism as two branches that just split apart at the Prophet's death. While the argument requires charitable readings, my argument would be this. Sunnism is so wide in scope that its literature preserves members who seem to occupy one of these six positions. Right? If I was asked, I could place a Sunni scholar in each group or a Sunni denomination in each group. So even with group six, you had these Hurufis or Ottoman Hurufism. You had Safavids before they converted to Shiism. There were Persian Sufis like the Qazilbash who became Shi'is over time, but had very mystical understandings of the world and the universe and Ali. Um, Shiism, by contrast, seems to occupy uh, four through six along this spectrum. And so, again, group one held animosity for Ali. Group two avoided his praise and veneration. Group three uh, accept, accepted him as a rightly guided caliph. Group four viewed him as the most superior Muslim after the Prophet. 
Group five held that God and the Prophet had anointed him Muhammad's rightful heir, and group six upheld his divinity. So if we were to zoom out past this 300 year period, you actually have people who now self-identify as part of a Sunni legal school or theological school, or they self-identify as part of a Shi'i theological school, and we can discuss some of those currents. So Shi'is can be accurately described as centering Ali and the Prophet's family at the core of their religious culture, they have separate circles of learning, books, and rituals that Sunnis do not, 300 years after the Prophet. For pro-Ali Sunnis, by this point they've come to revere Ali in very similar ways to Shiism. He's a hero who's remembered for being unparalleled in wisdom and in combat. And then the Prophet's de descendants, the Sayyids or Ashraf, Sada, are also revered in Sunni societies as nobility. And then we have those Sunnis who are skeptical of all of this reverence for Ali. Either um, they tend to show sympathy for the Umayyads, uh, they tend to be anti-Shi, and so when they discuss history, it's their aim to discredit pro-Ali arguments and to discredit uh, pro-Ali texts. Uh, you have those who are also more neutral on these questions, either because they're uninformed or they consciously don't want to wade into controversial waters. Uh, and so some Sunni laypersons remain aloof from these questions on what happened in history. And so the cultural code becomes one where it's like, I don't want to say something that will get me a, a problematic, put me in a problem, problematic position in the hereafter, or God will want to punish me in the hereafter because I've said something about someone who was a saint. Now, if the previous slide talked about people who were Laypersons, I would want to close by talking about those who are scholars. What was the role that Sunni orthodoxy played in all of these conversations about Ali? First, Sunni scholars viewed themselves as representatives of what would be correct in the sight of God, beliefs that are correct, and doctrines that are uh, correct. And so in, in that light, they sought to suppress and condemn overt anti-Ali sentiment. Right, they saw it as a heresy. Uh, it became a heresy to curse Ali or accuse him of sinfulness, even if in the first 200 to 300 years there were, there were people who did that. Um, but it became a heresy. So searching for these texts at times feels like looking for uh, needles in a haystack. And while I would love to take credit for doing it um, by opening up every book, that's not what I did. What I did is I, in the digital world, I can do string searches for Bulk Ali, you know, or Manlana, you know, so and so, and and this was super helpful because thousands of medieval texts have been digitized, and it, and, and it allows us to do these types of database searches. And so, uh, you can find texts where it says just that that so and so really despised Ali. He says, "I would curse him thousands of times a day." And I said, "Why would you do that?" And he says, "Because he was responsible for killing my ancestors at the Battle of Sabin." Right? This was someone who whose ancestors were part of a tribe that went to war against Ali in, in those civil wars. And this person was a Hadith transmitter, right? And so, hundreds of years later, you had scholars like Ahmed ibn Hanbal saying, okay, this is problematic, um, and uh, you know, we have to excise those texts, or at least condemn them as unreliable when that person is relating a Hadith about Ali and when she portrayed that. Second, Sunni scholars aim to discredit any whiff of Shiism. This included uh, texts portraying Ali as superior to his predecessors or noting any disagreements he had with them. For example, after the Prophet's death, when Ali, Fatima, and the Prophet's family had disagreements with the first caliph, some scholars rationalized that such reports were likely false because it didn't sit well with them that these figures could have any sort of conflict or be portrayed in this way. Third, Scholars circulated reports in which Ali appeared as a fallible person. Right? They may have done this unintentionally for two reasons. First, this organically happened whenever they drew on the legacy of Umayyads or pro three caliph Muslims who had narrated these types of reports, as my research demonstrates. And second, it was infidelity to belief in canonical culture, that these hadith that are in these canonical works 
must be true. And so this led people to say, well, I guess in this case, Ali must have upset the Prophet Muhammad, right? And so a famous example of this is in the collection of Bukhari that when the Prophet visits the home of Ali and Fatima for night prayers and they refuse to join him, the Prophet rebukes them. Or in another report, when Ali tries to marry the daughter of a prominent non-believer uh, who persecuted Muslims, uh, the Prophet delivers this sermon uh, rebuking Ali. And so two centuries after the fall of the Umayyads, Ali is this respected figure in Sunni culture, but in this new context, uh, scholars now assume that Ali would always be forgiven for any types of errors that he made. Um, and so when he's portrayed in these negative ways, the idea is that, well, God will probably forgive him for any wrongdoing that he did. Um, and so it's here we see the reception of literature antagonistic to Ali in its origins can end up in circles where people will charitably read it and say, well, you know, maybe uh, we can understand it differently, even if the original storytellers actually meant to negatively portray Ali or criticize him. And so let me close by stating that partisanship and the polarization of society outlasted the lifetime of these seventh century rulers of Arabia. Muslim culture preserves the sentiments of all of these factions that I mentioned. And so a study of the formation of Sunni orthodoxy regarding Ali is a study of all of these factions. I'd argue that the polarization in American politics today is reminiscent of 7th century Hashemid and Umayyad rivalries in, historic, in, this, in the historiography that ensued. The, you know, one, the previous president, uh, Donald Trump, is viewed as a polarizing figure with avid followers, and as we speak, we see how there are competing narratives of what he represented. For some, you know, he represents this uh, far-right, dangerous criminal. Uh, for others, he represents uh, a hero who is going to save America and make it great. Uh, the same can be said about former President Obama, who's viewed as a good person, who's viewed as a righteous leader by many, but he's reviled as evil and illegitimate by a rival tribe, right? During his tenure, there are some who supported a conspiracy theory that he was never born in the United States and that this made him illegitimate. And so 200 years from now, there will be partisans of Ali, uh, I'm sorry, partisans of, uh, let's say, President Obama and many historians who praise him, uh, but also a threat of antagonists, right? Relying on Fox News reporting, right-wing authors, or even foreign journalism that is uh, uh, critical of Obama and doesn't portray him as a praiseworthy person because of his policies related to drone warfare or other decisions that harm certain populations abroad. And so if you are looking at those competing historiographies, you can see one where he's portrayed as a hero and another where he's portrayed as a villain. The same can be said right now. We're in an election year with uh, Joe Biden, right? We're, this is a person or this is a president now who's considered complicit in the deaths of 50,000 people Right? when he may have had an opportunity to put pressure to stop that from happening? How are people going to remember that? How are people going to remember this person's legacy? Right? You have partisans that say he's sympathetic, he's great, he's a, he's a wonderful individual, he's, you know, he's, he's very soft-hearted, but then you have rivals or you have, you could say, critics of that legacy that will say, no, this person needs to be recognized someone who was complicit in a genocide. And you know, he, he may have had the opportunities to stop that, and he didn't. And so that polarization that's occurring in the United States is uh, something that we see in the legacy of how we talk about politics in Arabia, that you have people who love the Umayyad uh, cane because he represented their values. And when you say, well, how could someone support someone who supported a massacre? They would, you know, they would shrug that off and saying that those people, how do people shrug off massacres today? You have individuals who are so hard-hearted, they'll say, well, you know, those people deserve to die. You have other people who say, well, they just don't care, right? They just don't care. And so you see these same dynamics with these polarizing figures who have uh, been leaders not only 
contemporary world, but also in 7th century Arabia, and when you get into conversations with people and saying, you know, how do we hold these uh, leaders accountable when they're in blood on their hands, you see the type of reaction that occurs. But uh, as the decades pass, let us not be surprised with a spectrum that unfolds for the historiography related to 